Um, next up, we have Janice Walton. She's legal counsel for Blake's. Janice is a leading practitioner in the federal and provincial regulation of wildlife and specifically to species at risk. She advises clients regarding the implication of species at risk law on their operations and has successfully represented clients in species at risk litigation matters. So I'll open the floor up to Janice now to expand on the Canadian legislative context. So it's funny, just I'm going, just watching that, the, especially the last presentation, I. I think maybe the order might have been better if I'd gone before the last one because I, I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about the context of Sarah and why it is that we have this kind of situation where so much of that big piece of that pie is actually under provincial jurisdiction and why we're looking at more collaborative approaches as opposed to just hard law that says you can or cannot do something and, and, and what the background behind behind that is and, and the effective protection that she was talking about. So I'm going to try and try and give you some legal context. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what we see on the provincial legal side um, in terms of, of protection, not protection, et cetera. So uh, as I think you all know, there's, there's, there's four categories of risk that, um, that are identified under SARA. I'm not going to go through these and you're all sophisticated enough to know, to know what those are. Um, I'm not going to talk about the listing process itself because that is not really the topic. Janice, can we interrupt you for a sec? I think all we're seeing is your screen saver right now. I, I don't... Oh, wait a minute. I know it's wrong. Okay, hang on just a second. <laughs> I see what's going on. It looks very um, beautiful. <laughs> I, have, I have two... I have there two, we go. All right. Yeah, yeah. I've got two screens here. Yeah. I had it on the wrong screen, so now I have to figure out how to get okay. the PowerPoint for a minute. Okay, right. sorry. This is a beautiful introduction slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm uh, still not getting... I'm still not getting the actual PowerPoint presentation coming no, up for you guys. It's not, it's not, you just hit to, need to hit the um, presentation mode. I am, but it's not working. It's What it's doing is it's putting on my other screen. Wait a minute, I got another idea. Hang on. <laughs> now you've gone black, right? There you go. Yep, yeah. There you go. Perfect. All right. Okay. Okay, Thank so sorry about that. So, yeah, so I'm not going to go through the details of this, but, but essentially, um, and and uh, Danielle said, you know, that they, the, the legislation applies throughout Canada. That is correct. And the, um, but it has some, Sarah has some really unusual provisions, which essentially say, this is the law, but we're not going to apply this piece of the law to the provinces, um, except under, uh, under certain circumstances. I got to tell you, this is a very unusual structure. I've never seen it in other environmental law. I don't know that it actually exists anywhere. And when you when she said, I, I thought it was an interesting comment. She said a lot of people don't really understand the legislation. That's correct. And and in fact, it's not and it's not just sort of lay people. It's it's a lot of people in government and a lot of people, a lot of lawyers. And it's it's because it's a very very complex piece of legislation. It was done specifically because of things like the Accord. We want to have this co collaborative approach, and also quite frankly because of the way the Canadian Constitution is written. So it's it's um, it's 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 a very strange piece, and so it can be very hard to understand why where something applies and where it does not. In terms of what Sarah does, though, as, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, there's the species assessment and listing. There's the protections in Sarah, which is what I'm mostly going to talk about. I'll get back to that in just a moment. The recovery planning itself that applies to all of the country. The critical habitat protection. The permitting, which goes along with the protective part. So when you have something that's prohibited and you can't do it, you can only do it with a permit, then you have to go get a permit. And finally, environmental assessment. So in the context of Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, if you're doing analysis of, of a project, um, there are some direct links between SARA and recovery strategies, listing and recovery strategies, and those that environmental assessment that have to be done. What I'm going to talk about today, though, is the, the protections. So SARA prohibits harm to species and their residences. So, and, and these are species that are listed as endangered, threatened, or extirpated. And I see a, a spelling error there. I, I apologize, a grammatical error. So, and, and these are, what I, these three bullets here are actually um, just uh, sort of uh, summary of what, of what is prohibited. So trade is quite, it's quite a lengthy provision, different types of trade. But activities which kill, harm, harass, capture, or take an individual of a species or 
destroy or damage their residences. And then there's a whole, as I said, a whole bunch of stuff in, in, in terms of, of, of trade, and that specifically deals with things like smuggling, of course. Um, a residence, in case you're, you're, you're wondering, I mean, it's a dwelling place such as den or nest um, that is occupied or habitually occupied by one or more individuals. And there have actually been some been at least one court case on this regard um, dealing with a dealing with a, a, a ground nesting bird um, in which there was some photographers who removed a bush nearby because they wanted to take pictures of the bird and um, that was found to be part of the bird's residence so okay so here's where it gets really weird so essentially the species protections the protection says thou shalt not harm this species is um, automatically limited to federal lands. So, so, so in other words, if you have um, any species that are listed in SARA in those three categories that are on federal lands, uh, so for example, national parks as an example, then they are protected. Those prohibitions apply, and if you, if you, if you, the only way you can do anything to impact the species would be through permits. In addition, you have federal species. So federal species are, as, as she mentioned, aquatic species and migratory birds, which are also protected under the Migratory Birds Convention Act. So those federal species, wherever they are in Canada, are also subject to the protections. So for example, the killer whale is an example. Um, they, are, they are an endangered species and they are protected under SARA. Um, so the bottom line essentially is the prohibitions on harm to the species themselves, I'm not talking about critical habitat, the species themselves and their residences apply to migratory birds and aquatic species and to any other species that are on federal land, so terrestrial species on, on federal land. So then we have, as you know, the recovery planning stage, and there's there's four stages, to four different types of plans that are done. I'm not going to talk about these in detail. I just wanted to highlight that they, they do have these four. That the first two, recovery strategies and action plans, um, are with respect to the endangered, threatened, and extirpated species. So as as um, as Danielle mentioned, they they identify long and short term strategies and they identify critical habitat and the definition of critical habitat is on this slide and and why it's important is because as Danielle mentioned, the definition of critical habitat is not just about um, habitat it's or even critical habitat it's it's critical habitat that's actually been identified in a finalized recovery strategy and from a legal from a lawyer's perspective from legally looking at potentially what is protected that that's important um danielle also mentioned the 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 um the physical attributes part of that it's not just the area it's it's what's inside that area in terms of of the attributes that would support that critical habitat. That actually came out of a court case involving a species in British Columbia, where the court said that it's got, it's got to be both. So Sarah, on its face, protects the destruction, uh, prohibits the destruction of critical habitat of any listed endangered or threatened species. Um, but the application of this prohibition depends on the type of species and the location of the critical habitat. And that is what leads to the fact that a lot of critical habitat in British Columbia for terrestrial species is actually not legally protected under SARA. So and this is, this is I, I, I tried to summarize this. It's quite complicated because it depends on where and when, but essentially, if you have a national park, a marine protected area, a migratory bird sanctuary, or a national wildlife area, then um, what happens is once the critical habitat is identified in the recovery strategy, um, they publish a description of it in the Canada Gazette, and 90 days after the publication, then the prohibition then applies. So if you have, there are a number of species, for example, in places like Banff National Park, who have, for whom this has happened, and those are, are fully protected. Their critical habitat is protected from destruction. Um, for aquatic species, migratory birds, and other federal lands, so federal lands that are not one of those four categories, um, there's a different process, and this involves writing a protection order. So, so for aquatic species is a good example because again we've had some court court decisions on this. If you have um, critical habitat that is identified on, um, say, aquatic species, then the uh, minister is required, in this case it would be the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, is required to issue a protection order within 180 days 
or to make a statement that the um, that the critical habitat is protected in some other way under other legislation or under a con conservation agreement. This is quite similar for migratory birds except the orders made by the federal cabinet. I should tell you so far there's only been one protection order under Sarah and that is for the killer whales. Um, and there's only been one, as far as I'm aware, only two protection statements and the, and the one protection statement for the killer whales is actually overturned by the court. Um, essentially what the, Fisheries and Oceans Canada said is that the, the Fisheries Act protected the protected the um, the killer whales and the court said yeah not good enough because the Fisheries Act protection is not as strong as Sarah there's too much um, flexibility in in allowing for for um, authorizations to to uh, harm habitat so essentially the, uh, the so they issued a protection order instead so there's a killer whale this is the safety net that Danielle was talking about. So, the federal cabinet can order Sarah's prohibitions apply to non-federal species or its critical habitat on non-federal land. And there's a number of ways they can do it. They could either make it very specific to, they could say, for example, uh, well, using the, let's use the example that Daniel showed you, the Pacific water shrew, that critical habitat. The federal government could decide to issue a safety net order protecting the critical habitat of the Pacific water shrew in that particular area that's set out in the recovery strategy. On the very other end of the scale, they could say, um, we could actually, uh, on, on the way the legislation is written, they could apply the protections to the entire province. They could say, their protections for critical habitat apply to the province of British Columbia because the province is not effectively protecting. My understanding of, of the analysis that, that Danielle described and what I've, I've, I've spoken to with other federal people about is they focus on the specific species in the specific area. So if there were to be a safety net order, it's not likely to be this broad order that applies to the entire province. It would be to a specific species in a specific area. So as, as Danielle said, that. that Sarah says that you must rec the minister must recommend the order if it's, if the minister is of the opinion that the province or territory is not effectively protecting the species or its critical habitat, and then the cabinet has the discretion. Cabinet does not have to follow the minister's advice on this, and so that makes it, of course, in addition to being to being a technical decision, it becomes a political decision as well because there's other considerations that they have they will be looking at, and that's of course with the socioeconomic impacts may come into play. Um, so far we haven't we haven't seen any of this because it hasn't happened. Um, there hasn't been any sort of re recommendation on, for a safety net order and therefore there hasn't the cabinet hasn't done it. As uh, Danielle mentioned as well there's another order called an emergency order that actually has been used for the for the greater sage grouse and and there's this the current um, uh, proposal out with respect to the frog in in Quebec. So this is this allows the the federal cabinet to issue an order to protect either the species or its habitat and also to set out, depending on the kind of land it is, um, actual activities that can or cannot occur and that happened in the emergency order for the stage growth. I should mention that that emergency order is currently being reviewed or, or under under um, judicial review. There, there, was a, there was an appeal of that order and as of yet it's, it's not come through. So, so that's um, that, that will be interesting to see how the, how the court deals with that. So the options for protecting um, species that are not otherwise protected by SARA in the province, um, there's a bunch of them. One, we, the province could pass the Provincial Species at Risk Act. They, the province has elected not to do that. That was that you know that's a political decision that's been made more than once, um, but it's it's something they've decided not to do. Some of the provinces have taken that approach. Some of the provinces which did not have species at risk legislation when Sarah came into force took um, or, or had it, but it was very weak. They actually took steps to either do new acts, and, and a, the best example of that is in Ontario, which had an Endangered Species Act, but they repealed it and, and, and introduced a new one which has a lot more teeth. Um, or some, some jurisdictions who didn't have one at all have brought brought them in, but not all. Uh, Alberta and British Columbia do not. And I'm sorry, I had the list in front of me, and I um, I can't find it right now. But I think I, I, my recollection is Newfoundland and possibly Saskatchewan uh, do not have species at risk legislation. Now that's not to say that they don't have protections for species at risk. 
all of these jurisdictions have some form of protections within their other statutes like Wildlife Act, but they don't have a standalone piece of legislation. They, they, they assume it somehow into their, 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 their wildlife legislation. BC actually does have um, some protections for species at risk in the Wildlife Act. It's very, very minimal. And there's only four species that are listed there that have any protections. They did actually bring in an amendment, or they, they, they passed an amendment to the Wildlife Act to broaden the protections, but they've never brought that amendment into force. So that's one of the options. The other option is to amend the legislation you have, which is what BC has had proposed to do, to expand the existing protections. So things like the Wildlife Act, the Forest and Range Practices Act, all these various pieces of legislation that, that could be, and to some extent have been amended to, to add protections in different ways. Um, so, for example, the use of wildlife habitat areas and things like that has been expanded in the last 10 years under these pieces of legislation. But, but um, as of yet, they have not, BC has not gone forward to sort of extensively amend the Wildlife Act and bring the, the amendments into force um, to provide for the kinds of protections that, that Sarah has or the kinds of prohibitions that Sarah has. And then the third one is, is where we are. And this goes, this leads to the collaborative approach that you've seen in, 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 in the, in the slides by the two presentations, is the province can use existing powers granted under other legislation to address impacts of the environment. So the Local Government Act, and, and Danielle had that great list. I actually sat here last night looking at my slides and said, I should make a list. And I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't, because Danielle just gave it to you. But there's a long list of legislation through which regulators can find ways to provide for some protection for, um, for, for endangered species, or if not protection, planning that would, that would incorporate mitigation techniques and, and, and sometimes beyond mitigation, enhancement that will in fact benefit a species. And so there are, there are ways to do it, but it's not as cut and dry and black and white as you would see in other provinces where there is, where there is actual um, species at risk legislation. I want to I want to tell you about a case that I was involved in to give you an example of how this could be used and it's it's kind of an odd case to use because in fact this was a case where the protection was not upheld but but the it was an environmental appeal board case but what the environmental appeal board said about endangered species protection in BC I I, I found very very helpful and I think that 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 uh, I thought you might be interested in seeing what they actually had to say so this this involved a uh, a land developer with a subdivision was adjacent to a ravine in, in Abbotsford, and the land developer went to the 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 the, the local to Abbotsford. Um, the ravine was on municipal land, and the municipality required, as part of the development um, permit, that the a road be built through the ravine. Um, and that is it. For those of you who are familiar with with Abbotsford, it's the, it's it, it it would essentially be the final. Um, finishing uh, Marshall Road, which uh, stops and starts in several places. And this particular place where it stops, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the of the linking street. Essentially, what happens is to get from one area of Abbotsford to another, cars are forced to go through uh, neighborhoods which were never built for the purposes of having the kind of traffic that they have now. There's a school they have to pass. And, and it's a problem, and it's a and it's, and the reason it's there is because the road has never been completely finished, and so as a part of of the um, development uh, project, Abbotsford said to the developer, "We will give you a permit for, to subdivide this land and put some houses on it, but you're going to have to build this road through this ravine. You're going to have to finish it up through here. There's an intermittent stream in it, so as a result, the uh, landowner needs the proponent need to have a section a water act approval under section nine. That for those of you who are Looking at the Water Sustainability Act, those are, are now called change approvals under the under the Water Sustainability Act. So the developer applied for an approval for to put the road there, and the um, uh, in those days it was Ministry of, of uh, Ministry of Environment. No, it was the Water Manager. So it was a it was what I can't remember what the name of the department was in those days, but either way, the Water Manager rejected it. On the basis that it would adversely impact a number of species at risk, so there were there were some uh, there was some evidence that there would there may be Pacific water shrew, there may be um, Oregon forest snail, uh, um, and there was a couple of there was a plant and a frog, and I can't remember exactly which ones they were, 
Uh, of those, I know the Oregon forest snail and the Pacific water shrew were both within the either threatened or endangered categories. The other ones were of special concern. So the, the water manager rejected it. And so the proponent then went back to the drawing board and uh, reapplied with the revised plan, which includes mitigation. And, and the principal mitigation was um, building and enhancing, a, there was a small pond and was to, to, to enhance that and to protect it, to put fencing around this pond and do, to do some other work to try and um, preserve some areas for, for the species. But it was rejected again. Um, so they appealed the decision, and we went to the Environmental Appeal Board, um, and the board overturned the decision and actually ordered the manager to issue the approval um, on conditions set by the board, which were based on a, a bunch of mitigation that had been, that had been suggested. Um, there were actually technical reasons for overturning the decision. And, and that was because it was found after there were a whole bunch of um, biologists and things that, that were that that um, that uh, testified to the board. The board actually concluded that the species, those particular species, um, were unlikely to persist in the ravine, even if the application was not granted. They had been gradually disappearing from the ravine, and in fact, the conditions in the revised application, if anything. Um, might uh, assist in the um, the persistence of at least some of, of the species. I just just as a, a matter of background, so you, you understand what happened here. This particular ravine, because it's public municipal property, is a very busy area for people who like to walk, and it's also a very busy area for people who like to mountain bike. And and so there was a there was there were a bunch of wooden structures that that people had built in there, and a little bridge, and and and, and there was a fort that some kids had built, and there was it was it was really not a particularly ideal location um, for for these species. It was completely unprotected, and there was actually a lot of activity going on. That the board found that if if the road actually got built and these areas were fenced off as as part of that building, um, then uh, then that if anything it would it would protect them. The board also made some comments that 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 it was of the view that they could act the province could actually do a lot more for protecting species in in the area. This is in the Sumas Mountain area. Um, that it that it really the, the the province could could actually you know from a legislative perspective do a, do a lot more. However, so from the species protection point of view, on this case, it seems like a bad example. However, what was interesting about the case is what the board said. Um, because there was a discussion about, well, these, there's this legal protection under SARA, but the legal protection under SARA doesn't apply. So, you know, what does that mean in terms of what I, the regulator, what the water manager in that particular case can do if you don't have a legal, you don't have a species at risk act that actually applies to these particular species? And the board said that they have to decide what's the decision maker's responsibility and protecting them from harm, given that there, there's no actual law that, that prohibits this particular kind of harm. Um, and so, so um, what the board said, well, and I, I, well, here we go. The panel finds the Water Act not limited to relatively simple issues of water use and flow, but reflects a broader legislative intent to protect various aspects of the natural environment. So essentially what the board was saying is when you go get a Section 9 approval, it's not just about protecting the water flow, it's, a, it's about protecting the environment. There's lots of things in the Water Act and the regulations that, that state that, and those have been carried forward into the, into the Water Sustainability Act now. Um, the board said the words vegetation and natural environment are important, and, and because they provide habitat to certain species, and they found that they are relevant considerations. So at the same time, while saying in this particular area, we don't think it's actually going to work, the board said it was legitimate for the water manager to consider the habitat and the and the and the health of these species in considering whether or not the the permit the approval should be granted. <coughs> and that's what the board went on to say. The board said that just because we don't have law, we don't have a species at risk law, doesn't mean that consideration of the impact of the revised application on the species is not important or relevant. The board said that, found that it was um, and went on to say that, that species which are at risk should actually be given special consideration under, in this particular case, Section 9 of the Water Act. So the board was prepared to say, yeah, we don't have a law that protects the species, but when you are considering 
impacts on the environment and you've got endangered species, you ought to give that special consideration. I, which I thought was a very interesting decision by the board, recognizing that there is no BC law that, that protects them. Not all of them. Some, some species are protected under Wildlife Act and things like that. Excuse me. Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to highlight that case. It was kind of an interesting case because it's it's a I think it's an important decision in terms of of understanding what the um, what the the a what are the duties, what legal duties do you have versus what are your parameters, what's your scope. So if you are if you're a land manager and your job is to is to issue a permit or a development permit of some sort, and you're looking at the environment. This case from the Environmental Appeal Board certainly would support uh, an, uh, an assertion that you need to give special consideration to endangered species. But it also confirms that when you get into the, the, the court case and, or the, the a board decision and read the whole thing, that there's no actual, for those particular species in that particular area, there's no actual legal protection that would necessarily apply. So we're in a kind of an odd world in BC in that we have, we don't have the sort of hard legal protections, but we do have this collaborative approach and all these other pieces of legislation that can be used to provide some protections. Um, but but they don't necessarily, they're not as, they're not as, as definitive and as clear. In some ways it makes it uh, a lot harder for everyone, the regulators, the proponents of projects and, 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 and conservation groups, et cetera, to really get their head around how do we protect this? Because it's 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 not really law. It's it's more um, policy than law. Anyway, that's that's what I have. That's the end of the slide presentation. So. Hi, Janice. Thanks so much for that. Uh, so now we're going to just open up the floor to any questions. I haven't seen any typed in yet, but someone had emailed me in a question. Um, so we're gonna turn on the mics for all three speakers. Um, so anyone can, any of you three can comment. Um, so someone asked, can local municipalities override the species at risk federal slash provincial legislation? And that was Ted. Um, I can, I can, I can handle that one. I think, I, I think, I think maybe we've kind of already answered it, but um, you know, in terms of override, there actually isn't any law. Well, let me back up. You know, if you have a recovery strategy, as an example, and you have a, or you have a species that's listed as, as endangered, as we've just pointed out and what, and Danielle showed it, that, is that the protections of those species don't necessarily apply, and the protection of that critical habitat doesn't apply because there hasn't been a safety net or. So in terms of overriding, they certainly don't have to be as stringently bound to, say, the areas of the critical habitat because they, it's not legally protected under the other statutes. It's more of a, you should be considering them and, and figuring out how to, how to deal with them, but in terms of overriding, there's really nothing specific to override at the moment absent a, a safety net order. That's my take on it. Uh, would any of the other speakers like to respond to that? I guess I could add a little bit to that. So you may recall in my presentation I talked to our assessment of effective protection. So the actions that landowners and land managers are taking and the implementation of the tools they do have, how they apply them to provide protection for habitat is something that we're assessing. And that information informs what we bring forward to the minister and what the minister bases her decision on. So. I guess we're at an earlier stage than overriding anything because we do not have an order in place in BC. And as I mentioned, we are aiming to not go to a place where an order is even needed to be recommended by the minister. So that's where we're at and the, the attention is to work with local governments so that's not even part of the conversation. That's, that's the hope and the ideal and what we're working towards. And I guess going farther than that, it, it would be a matter of seeing some of this play out and, and being tested, as Janice was speaking about the greater speech grouse, for example. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, I mean, I, I think what Danielle says is, is absolutely correct. And, you know, if, if, 
if the regulators in BC, if BC doesn't have any new law on this, and the regulators in BC just essentially ignore it, then they are definitely increasing the risk that the federal government is going to find itself, in a, or the cabinet is going to find itself with a, a recommendation from the minister that they need to apply the species at risk protections in British Columbia in some fashion or another. So it's uh, that. So it makes sense. The approach that Danielle um, set out makes complete sense to me. I yeah. very much. Oh, Just ahead, from a BC sorry. perspective, um, I think that's like that's the main reason why the Species at Risk five-year plan came about. So mm -hmm. Janice is correct. We did pass the Wildlife Amendment Act, but it hasn't been brought into force. But one of the major things that one of the major initiatives under the Species at Risk five-year plan is to examine opportunities um, for enhancing protection. Um, and yes, we use a suite of tools, but um, there is also an uh, project underway um, and there will be an engagement component to that so just um, mm. get heads up there as well. I'm sorry Lynn, Lynn if I can ask a question as Janice here is, is the, the, the five-year plan talked about um, looking at the legislation and seeing if there were that's right. tweaks that could be made to it as opposed to passing a whole new law. Um, do, do you know if that's under be, uh, being undertaken or? Well, yeah, I mean, I worked for, like, um, several years ago, there was a, a big push to um, mm -hmm. examine bringing the Wildlife Amendment Act into force, and I was working with yeah. lawyers, and we examined it. One of the major issues is, and the reason we have a suite, is we have pieces of legislation where their original intent was for a variety of different reasons. So the Wildlife Amendment, Act, or the Wildlife Act, at least, is, it was originally intent, and the original intent was more, um, was less on conservation, shall we say. It's old, and um, the intent was slightly different. So there are complications. The reason that we stalled on bringing the Wildlife Amendment Act into force is because there ends up being some um, slight conflict and um, complexities to doing that. Um, and so the reason we have the Speech to Risk five-year plan is to um, do a review and an assessment of the best opportunity of moving forward. Okay, I just want to, uh, we've got a three-parter question here from Scott. Um, are there cases where the Species at Risk Act applies if a federal permit is involved for project removing species at risk? And then he also asks, uh, or if the federal government is funding the project, and then lastly, uh, not on federal land, though. Mm -hmm. And those questions should show up in your uh, question box as well. Not that I can see. Not me okay. either. So do you need to repeat the question? Are there cases where the Species at Risk Act applies if a federal permit is involved for a project removing, for, removing species at risk and if and or if the federal government is funding that project? I guess I would say there are projects funded on federal land and it wouldn't be so much removal as handling the species to do whatever research is being undertaken, which would require a permit because it talks about harassing, molesting, as a colleague of mine says, tickling a species, anything you might do around touching it on federal land would have a permit associated and we do fund projects on federal land to help learn more about the species. But I'm not sure I'm answering the, the intent behind the question. Scott, if you want to provide any clarification, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, this one's from Tanya. Go ahead. Sorry, I just, I, I think you know what Danielle just said is, is that it goes back to is the species protected? If the species or its critical habitat are protected, then you need a permit if you're going to if you're going to do anything that goes against that protection. And so, you know, the the baseline is species on federal land or aquatic species and migratory birds, um, on on off everywhere. Um, as of yet, there are other than sage grouse, there are no other orders that would extend those protections. So right now, that's that's the situation. Yeah, but other than the one that Danielle had mentioned in regards to the uh, western chorus frog, um, which is something in play 
uh, but that's, a, I think, a separate judicial order that's happening right now. Uh, yeah, one of the cool. questions... Right, yeah, in, in, in Quebec, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, from Tanya, what does a local government need to do prior to issuing approvals for, approvals for development within critical habitat for non-migratory and non-aquatic species? And, of course, the example of Pacific water shrew is a good one. Oregon forest snail would be another one. Do you mean to repeat that? Sure, repeat it, please. <laughs> okay. Um, and this question crops up quite a bit, and it's and and this is Pamela from the SCCP, so I know that um, we have this as an ongoing conversation item when we work with local governments. What does a local government need to do prior to issuing approvals for development within critical habitat for non-migratory and non-aquatic species? So an example would be Pacific water shrew, and I'll throw in. Uh, street bank lupin and Oregon forest snail, all the ones that have um, proposed or finalized recovery strategies. Right. So one of the things that is happening is this is playing out more and more. As I mentioned from the beginning, we had many recovery documents that we were late in producing based on the timelines outlined in Sarah. So now that we have more recovery documents posted as final, on the registry, the question of effective protection is coming to the fore more. So for species like Pacific Water Shrew that have a finalized recovery strategy, we're working towards figuring out exactly what, what does that mean on non-federal land now that we have a final recovery document. And we're working with the province and with local governments and landowners to figure that out. And it's very much a a case by case situation right now and it's depending on what habitat is there and what are the plans that the land owner has that may impact that habitat. And so one of the approaches that have been implemented is to first have the, the land owner or the local government as well to contact the the lead on that species within the province. And then the lead on that species in the province can put forward recommendations and suggestions and help the people work through it. In some cases, what has happened is that landowners have hired a qualified environmental professional to walk their property to look at, is the critical habitat on that property? So are the biophysical attributes present? Are the activities that the landowner is planning in any way impact that habitat and put forward a report with recommendations that then can be reviewed by the province, by the local government, by the landowner to, to ensure that they feel comfortable that whatever they're doing is not impacting the, the habitat. So that's a, um, a proactive approach that people are taking, that some people have decided to take knowing that a, a, a strategy has been finalized. There aren't any laid out requirements or steps, checklists, things like that, that people can use. Because as I mentioned, we're just really trying to work through what does that protection mean. So. That's kind of the stage that we're at right now. Right. Um, I would also add that um, some of the municipalities that the SCCP has been working with, uh, Surrey is a good example. Um, we're hopefully going to be having a webinar with Stephen Godwin uh, at the end of the summer. He's working on uh, pushing some things through his council right now. Um, and also having another provincial regional staff person talk about uh, initiative that they're working on. But uh, City of Surrey is, is looking at trying to address these problems because they're front and center with um, dealing with potential litigation now for development permitting on uh, parcels that have critical habitat. So we'll hopefully see some case studies coming out of there that we can share more effectively. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I have another question. This one's for Lynn. All right. Leanne Johnson inquires, what can a local municipality do to protect an ultra-dry marine hemlock ecosystem on private land that contains no Sarah species, but is itself a rare ecosystem? 
Okay, you were cutting out a little bit, but um, I think basically the question is what tools there are to protect habitat in general. So Danielle actually had a really good slide that gave a bunch of different tools that are available, um, everything from DPAs um, and OCPs, um, uh, bylaws, there's, there's sort of a laundry list um, of things that are available. There's other resources like the Green Bylaws Toolkit that you can look for more information. Um, it depends on what you already have in your, in your own local government. Um, so um, I think another good resource if you aren't already familiar with the discussion paper, there's a bunch of recommendations in there and information in there as well. I'm also um, trying to set up, which is proving to be more complicated than I thought, but with this new web page that we have, I'm trying to create some kind of Yammer site or some kind of way of having an interactive self-help because part of the part of the reason that the local government working group that I you know, formed that group is so that it's almost like a self-help center. So if local governments are looking for specific wording, I feel like you know the province can provide some guidance, but um, sometimes some of your best um, information sources might be your neighboring areas um, to provide that kind of more very specific local information. Um, or as I say, Flynn Row offices, the Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations um, Ministry tends to be more on the ground than me. Um, I tend to you know, be up at that policy, strategic policy level. So um, I, I think, yeah, that those are probably your best resources. You're welcome to email me and I can provide a little more information if you like, if that didn't answer everything you needed. Thanks very much. Um, it's Pamela again, and, and I would add that um, just based on my knowledge, if there are species there that are protected under the Wildlife Act, the Migratory Birds Convention Act, or um, you know possibly the Fisheries Act, that those things would come into play regardless. And, and also there's ident potentially identified wildlife if it's uh, crown forest land. So there are other things, even if there aren't Sarah listed species, that might come into play protection wise. Uh, the next question is from David Haley. Um, so again, a question for Lynn. Um, I think you've probably been asked this one before, but do you have a timeline for the incentive program to be approved by senior decision makers? And is your presentation available for presentation to individual local governments? Um, yes, well, right now I can tell you that um, Overall, it has been approved by something called the Provincial Species at Risk Committee, which is otherwise known as PSARC. Um, the core members are Ministry of uh, Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations and Ministry of Environment. So it has been approved at that level, which is um, a, a, a director and an executive director level. Uh, so we're moving up to sort of ADM level uh, shortly, and we're starting to ensure that our colleagues in other ministries um, at higher senior exec levels are being briefed as we speak. So basically what we're looking for is approval to continue moving forward on those four short to medium term recommendations that I listed in the presentation. Um, I think before I can start going out and talking um, in you know more detail to groups, um, I'd want to make sure that we had those approvals uh, first at those higher levels, and that we're sort of underway with those projects because it'll be much more relevant for people. Uh, so in terms of sharing um, sharing the the pieces of information, I'd probably want to hold off obviously until those uh, appropriate levels um, have been briefed and approved moving forward on them. I can at least share that we have recommended those four uh, topic areas for moving forward, though. And what about uh, the presentation that you've done? Um, if you get an invitation to do that to local governments, uh, are you able to? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm presenting to a bunch of local governments now, and I um, <laughs> presented I presented something very similar to the Salish Sea um, conference. Right. So, absolutely, um, that's that's no problem at all. All right, thanks. We have time for two more questions. This one, um, somewhat related to the uh, previous forestry or rare ecological community one. Uh, it's from Glenn Dunsworth. We are sorry, given we have no SARA protection for ecosystems in the CDF, Coastal Douglas Fir, and we're working to develop conservation plans for woodlots with significant portions of listed CDF ecosystems in mature forest condition, what can be used to compel Ministry of Forests and licensees to protect these ecosystem conditions? The Coastal Douglas Fir Conservation Partnership has a strategy, but no jurisdiction or funding, and the Ministry of Forests has not been keen on reducing woodlot annual allowable cut, and Ministry of Environment seems to have no clout. Uh, that's a tough one. So there's a big help with a question mark there. 
Um, I don't know, Lynn, that probably would be close to you unless, Janice, you've got anything that you want to add from a provincial perspective. Um, I know identified wildlife Dixon on crown lands, but I'm not sure about uh, private woodlots. Um, I could, yeah, I mean, we, I, I didn't entirely grab all of those elements, to be honest, but um, in terms of private managed forest land, there is um, legislation, the mm -hmm. Private Managed Forest Land Act, um, and um, in terms of sort of getting Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations, I think part of the question was to ensure that they were sort of engaged, and certainly, um, I mean, they, they are helping to lead the CDFCP, um, conservation, the Coastal Douglas Fair Conservation Partnership. Um, so, and I work with them very actively, so they're already pretty engaged. At, I might have missed mm -hmm. some of the specifics of it, though. Yeah, and then I can just add, I, you know, they said woodlot. I, I wasn't clear whether they're talking about private land or or, or a, a woodlot under under um, under the Forest Act. But but either way, um, you know. It, Engaging with those ministries, they are the ones that have the, the the authority under the various pieces of legislation, which can be used in 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 in, in depending on on where they are, to provide for some protections. And and uh, I'm not sure if there's a, a legal tool outside of those that that can be applied here. And I would add that um, the SCCP has been collaborating with the Coastal Douglas Fir Conservation Partnership. Um, you know, we, we have the same sort of challenges as a non-regulatory body uh, facilitating these sorts of conversations when we're, um, you know, posed with situations where we know that activities are going on that, uh, you know, there, there may potentially be legislation to deal with it, um, or it's simply an issue of, of good practices by qualified environmental professionals and that's not necessarily happening. You know, how, how, you know, can we get that message out that there needs to be more of a, a, a compelling argument uh, to take action? And I don't have an easy answer for that either. Uh, I think it's something that hopefully we'll see happen over time when there is more harmonized legislation between SARA and uh, the provinces. Um, I have another question. In regards to municipalities, uh, this one's from Anne Baird. Uh, what if a municipality, and, and Danielle or Janice or Lynn, you may want to respond to this. Um, this will be our last question. Um, what if a municipality in BC wants to protect a, new, a few species at risk? A uh, sharp-tailed snake habitat is a good example, but is finding very little that they can do. For example, if the municipality says no to a mine from a land use perspective, but the landowner can go ahead and get a mines permit and habitat would be lost, how do they deal with that? Uh, that kind of reminds me of the uh, run of the river project issue in the past too. Uh, well, just Janice, yeah, just on a, a very high level, I, I hate to be a naysayer, but but uh, I mean the the, the 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 province, the legislatures made decisions about who has jurisdiction over what. And and you know if they have a mines act that, that that you can get a permit that would and the municipality has nothing they can do about that. I'm I'm that's really unfortunately it's a it's a political fix. It's not a it's not there's not a tool there that they can go back and say well you can't do that. I mean you have to work within the legislation you've got right. And it's uh it, it's um there are there are choices made by the legislature as to what is going to take is going to take precedence. Oh. And yeah, I think you're right, Janice, but I mean, yeah. part of the reason that we formed PSARC, the Provincial Species at Risk Committee, was to definitely foster um, great cl collaboration between the ministries, right. recognizing that species at risk doesn't fall in one camp only. So mm -hmm. although the core members are Flynn Rowe and MOE, um, there's a number of other, other ancillary members that are involved from different ministries. So that is part of the reason. I mean, you're right, we can't really get around legislation easily, but in terms of sort of policy and best management uh, practices, yeah. that's one of the roles. Of course. Yeah. And one thing I could add to that, when we do consultation and engagement around recovery documents, we ask, are there threats to the species that you're aware of? And we're always interested in knowing that. And because we have that bilateral agreement in collaboration with the province, we have an opportunity to bring forward to whichever ministry is making decisions on land, information about species at risk and what's happening there. Because as I mentioned, you know, and, and true, Janice's comment about even within government, within 
law firms, they're a super complicated and not everyone is aware of what's involved and may not even be aware that there's a species at risk there that they should be considering. So if we have uh, information about what's going on, then we can help to engage the right ministries around that. So I think you have a few different avenues. You have SEER, you have us, you know, the conservation organizations within your community are other options as well. Thanks very much. Um, I also wanted to add, thanks very much, Scott. He's provided some information. I completely for, had forgotten about that. Uh, the BC Environmental Mitigation Policy, I'm not sure if uh, folks on the call have actually heard about that. Um, that was a process that took several years to come to fruition. It can be used to provide best management practices for protecting listed uh, ecological communities at risk or rare ecosystems. So uh, you can probably find that online, BC Environmental Mitigation Policy, and check that one out. I'm going to turn it over now to Christine to wrap things up. Thanks, Pamela. So we'd like to thank our three speakers, Lynn, Danielle, and Janice, for providing such a wealth of knowledge. Uh, thank you for your everyday efforts, which continue to help species at risk. We'd also like to thank the Real Estate Foundation of BC for their financial support. Uh, the webinar that was tentatively set for next week will be rescheduled for some time in the summer when our speakers are available. Um, and we'll be posting this webinar recording to our SCCP website. Um, and you'll get to follow up emails just uh, giving you that information. Thank you for joining us to explore and discuss the species at risk in context. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with me at conservationplanner at sccp.ca if you have any further questions or seek to work with us to help increase protection of species and ecosystems at risk. Uh, that's all, folks. Have a great day. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.